Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. A uh, quick vlog for you just to keep you up to date on what's going on. Firstly, my apologies, of course, for the lack of videos lately. That is going to be a continuing problem until my treatment is over in about four weeks. Those of you who missed the first vlog explaining what was going on, I'm currently undergoing radiotherapy and concurrent chemotherapy for stage 3 colon cancer, which is obviously something that kind of gets in the way of doing my job. Uh, the problem with chemotherapy and radiotherapy is they have a cumulative effect on you which often causes fatigue and that sort of derails my ability to do my job. It's also a case of having to go to radiotherapy every day, having to reschedule my life around the idea of taking these chemo doses at specific times and going to get the radiation five days a week and then dealing with any side effects that come along. So it's disrupted things, although I have to say I'm really quite surprised by the fact that for the last month our numbers have stayed constant, over 10 million views. That's got to be your doing, right? I mean, I can't see who else it could be, and I'm going to choose to take that as a gesture of support from the viewers. It helps to have a positive attitude, and I'm going to choose to believe that that is why we're still at 10 million views, even though we've been putting out less than half the videos that we usually do. So thank you for that. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what the treatment entails because I get a lot of questions and I'd rather just answer them all at once and hopefully it makes people feel a little bit more at ease with the whole situation. I think the problem with this is that staying quiet makes people feel uneasy, but sharing too much information also makes people feel uneasy. Nobody wants to talk about cancer, right? Of course they don't. But it is something that affects many of our lives one way or the other, whether it be ourselves or whether it be family members or friends. Okay, so the therapy sort of goes along these lines. I take oral chemotherapy twice a day alongside five doses of radiation every week, okay? So it's beam radiation. I go to a radiotherapy center and I basically lie on a table. They align me with a bunch of lasers and stuff like that. I actually have stuff written all over my body for this and I believe I'll be getting tattoos in the locations next week once they've perfectly aligned the beam just to make it easier for them to sort things out. You kind of lie on this bed with a pillow and they've got this sort of mold that they make of your legs to make sure you're always in the same position every time. So you lie in that and the nurses set everything up and it's fairly quick. And then of course they leave the room cause nobody wants to be around that shit. And then they hit you with about three minutes of beam radiation in three or four different locations. Eh? And of course they're targeting the specific area. There's uh, gonna be a bit of damage around it, obviously. You know, they can't be super precise, but they're pretty damn precise. You know, technology has come along quite nicely. And the point of that is to try and shrink the existing cancerous material, yeah, the tumor. They want to make the tumor smaller. The smaller they make it, the further they can push it back because this thing's already into the bowel wall, right? So they want to shrink it to make sure it doesn't go any further. And that means that when they eventually cut it out, they will cut a much smaller area than they otherwise would. It also means that it will help to make sure they get all of it. Now, this procedure is actually completely painless. You go in, you get set up. I mean, you don't even have to check in. You've just got this little card that you swipe. You get changed. You wait for about five minutes in the waiting room. And then you get on the table. It's over and done with in about five minutes. And then you leave. It's as simple as that. And you do that five days a week and you get the weekends off. Now, the chemo is something called Zoloda, which is an oral pill. It's actually a lot of oral pills. And some of you are saying, well, what other kind of pills are there? Oh, you don't know about those? Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll keep you in blissful ignorance about the other kinds of pills. But anyway, this stuff you take a, a fairly large amount of every day and the dose is very heavily monitored by your oncologist, yeah? They look at what they have information-wise, they check the size and the stage, and they also compare it with things like your body mass, your height, your weight, your age. They think they basically pick what they think you can tolerate and then they hit you with it. And it's three 500 milligram tablets and two 150 milligram tablets twice a day, about half an hour after eating. Yeah. Now that's actually been the roughest part for me, not the side effects, but taking the pills in the first place. I'm very bad at swallowing pills. So I've had to get a pill cutter and cut these things down the middle, which 
is not a brilliant idea, but we've been assured by the oncologist that you can do that as long as you are nowhere near the blade. As you might imagine, if you're undergoing chemo and radiotherapy, your immune system takes a hit and it makes you much more prone to infection. So if you cut your finger, that can turn into some nasty stuff. So we got a pill cutter to make sure it didn't happen. It's still difficult for me to swallow the things and that takes the three pills plus two smalls all the way up to eight things that I've got to swallow in total, which is not actually easy. I've got to do that one at a time. I have problems with it and sometimes get stuck in my throat, which is not so pleasant. And those things, obviously, they taste pretty bad. You know, once the coating comes up, which, which takes about five seconds, they start to taste like chemicals. They smell pretty bad as well. So that that's not too great. And you've got to sort of time out when you're going to take them because you've got to take them half an hour after eating and you've got to take them 12 hours apart. So you've got to be awake for quite some time, which can be quite difficult when you're getting the effects of fatigue. So it's a case of maybe sleeping a little bit during the day, having a nap, coming back, and uh, trying to make sure they go down. Now, what I will say is that after a week and a half of this, I've only experienced minor side effects with the exception of one night. About three days into the chemo, I had massive pain in my right shoulder. Really, really unpleasant. And I also was vomiting at the same time as well. And I was shivering and everything was a complete mess. Uh, I went to the oncologist the following day and they gave me IV fluids just to rehydrate me because I was suffering from dehydration and they gave me an anti-emitic as well. And the main problem was that for the first few days I was without my anti-nausea medication because the insurance declined it, which is a bit weird. You know, the way insurance works over in the US is very strange. The chemo itself, if I was uninsured, would be ridiculously expensive, but... In total, the chemo is actually costing me $80, which is nothing. Like, the actual cost of the medication is vastly more than that. So, my insurance had me covered there, but they wouldn't cover that specific anti-nausea medication. And they said it would cost me $2,000 a bottle. But they covered a different anti-nausea medication, which effectively did the same job. And that cost me $8 a bottle. So, uh, it's, it's a bit of a mystery. Uh, thankfully, outside of the operations that I've had so far... Everything's actually been very, very cheap and affordable. The operations are an absolute killer. You know, the surgical staff, it costs a lot, even with the insurance. I looked at the price of one of them. I think without insurance, it would have been $25,000. And I was in the hospital for two hours. You what? And even with the insurance, I was paying, you know, obviously a portion of that. But yeah, so far, thankfully, the American healthcare system has not screwed me over. But outside of that one night, I've actually been okay. I've had stomach cramping, I've had fatigue, and I've had sort of mild nausea, but the antiemetic has dealt with that now. So sometimes I'll have an upset stomach and maybe I'll get a headache, it won't be too bad. But I'll mostly just feel tired, and that's really about it. So I guess I should count myself as being very fortunate that the side effects are not hitting me hard. They will get worse, because of course radiation is a very cumulative kind of thing. So it's expected that I will be affected much worse later on. But I have no doubt that I can deal with those side effects. If the chemo was going to have a really bad reaction for me, then honestly, it would have happened by now. I'm getting a little bit of hand and foot syndrome, which is very common amongst chemo patients. That means your skin on your hands and feet kind of dries out and cracks. Uh, so my hands are drying out a little bit, but I'm dealing with that with moisturizer. I'm just trying to stay off the computer as much as I can. And uh, I'm getting a lot more exercise, actually. It's, it's strange, really. I've... As much as I feel fatigued, I also feel the desire to be active and be out and not kind of sit around and do nothing. I've taken the opportunity to go swimming every day since the weather here has been really good. So I've been spending a couple of hours in the pool, which means that I've got some color back in my cheeks, getting that vitamin D, getting a little bit of cardio, uh, and making sure that I'm at least staying active and not sedentary. And it's good, you know, it's making me feel very positive about how things are going. And Positivity is very important, obviously. <laughs> you can't really give in to this kind of stuff. The treatment should be over in, I believe it's now three and a half weeks. After that, there'll be a six-week period where the treatment will kind of continue to work. You know, it doesn't just go away as soon as you stop it. So the effects of it will continue. The radiotherapy, as I said, will shrink the tumor in the area. And the chemotherapy will hopefully kill the cells and the actual cancer itself, making sure that it can't spread any further. You know, that's the end goal of it, is to make sure this thing doesn't go to stage four, which is where it metastasizes the different parts of your body, and then, frankly, you are completely and totally boned. Well, not completely, but you're in, you're in a world of hurt. Yeah, that's a much, much worse situation. The survival rates plummet. Survival rates for this stage are actually very, very good. Now, 
I know some of you have been looking things up and saying, oh, 50% or whatever. Here's the thing you got to bear in mind about survival rates is that a lot of the people that get this particular kind of cancer are actually quite old and already have a lot of problems. So the survival rates also include people that not only die from the cancer, but also from something else in the five years after they get it. Yeah. So, more often than not, you'll have an 80-year-old that gets this thing, maybe they beat it after some chemo, but something else gets them in the five years afterwards, and it's counted as a death to cancer, which is a little strange. I found out that the actual survival rates of people of my age are much, much higher, especially if there's proper treatment. So, I mean, I'm going to be frank, I'm not that worried about it. Once the six weeks are up, they will cut the thing out of me. And obviously I'll go through a little bit of recovery there, and if they think there's anything else, they'll put me most likely on IV chemo, which will suck, there's no doubt about that, but it will most likely be fairly low intensity IV chemo to just make sure that everything is completely gone. It's possible they won't have to do that. Uh, the oncologist said it was possible that it would be a 100% reduction, they get everything, but they can't know that. Yeah? So they wanted to prepare me for uh, the worst case scenario there. But they're very confident that they'll be able to deal with it. I'm very confident they'll be able to deal with it. I'm getting excellent care. Everyone is very professional, very nice, but also very realistic and honest, which is good. Uh, I can call them anytime for anything I need, which is fantastic, so... Yeah, things are trucking along nicely, but as I said, it's going to affect my ability to work. There's no doubt. I'm trying my best. And that comes along to the second subject, which is the podcast. So I cannot do the podcast on weekdays anymore, at least not for the next month, because I have five days a week of radiotherapy, and that is not optional. Yeah. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to move it. And at the moment, we're looking at moving it to Saturdays. And it's going to be slightly earlier in the day. It's going to be 9 a.m. PDT, which is midday EDT, which would be 5 p.m. in the British Isles and 6 p.m. Central European Summertime. So maybe a bit better for the Europeans, maybe slightly worse for those on the West Coast. But again, it is on a weekend. That is really the only time I can do it, unfortunately. I should be okay. And I did the first weekend off and I felt fine. I felt great, actually. And it wasn't really a problem. So I don't anticipate it being too big a problem. But we will have issues with getting Dodger and Jesse all the time. Because they'll be going to conventions and things like that. So I'll work around it. I'll get guest hosts. I just want to make sure that the podcast continues to roll onwards. But that's our current plan. So the next podcast should air live on the 5th of July. At 9pm PDT. Which is midday EDT. Hopefully. And that'll be over on twitch.tv slash totalbiscuit as usual. Now, since I covered this in a SoundCloud and didn't actually make a video about it, I'll quickly cover the whole 60 FPS video thing. I'll be moving all WTFs over to 60 FPS video as soon as it's available. I'm trying to get access to it earlier, obviously. I want to be part of the test group if that's possible. So far, it seems like the stuff that's on YouTube that was uploaded it doesn't really run at 60 FPS. Like, if you look at the actual YouTube stats, you'll notice that it's not getting up to 60. I looked at it, I'm like, you know, I'm usually pretty good at spotting the difference between 30 and 60, even if it's a video and I'm not playing it. And that does not look like 60 to me. And I checked the stats and it was more like kind of 38. I was like, ooh, okay, well that sounds like it's not, it's not completely done yet. So there's a number of possibilities. I, I tried a couple of different browsers with it. Maybe the HTML5 player isn't working properly. Maybe my ISP is terrible, but... As I said, I, those were not running at 60 for me, so maybe they've got a little bit more work to do before this thing actually comes out. But once it does come out, and once I know it's reliable, I will release my videos in 60 FPS. My WTF is videos at any rate. I'm not going to release content patch at that. That's almost impossible. The footage I have to use in the background will not be 60. It's ultimately a waste of time to do that. But for WTF is where you want the most accurate impression of the game, obviously you'd like to see it at the frame rate it's actually running at. That's an absolutely huge deal. And I'm also happy to be able to create a video that will actually demonstrate there is a real difference between 30 and 60. And finally, some of these deniers might sneak back into the woodwork from once they came. My two concerns about the 60 FPS thing, one is the idea that 60 FPS quality might be very bad. I mean, 1080p, I'm already getting quite a few videos just shredded quality-wise for no reason. My originals are very good, and yet I upload them to YouTube and they look like absolute arse. Like, you probably remember my Titanfall video, that looked absolutely terrible. And yet my original looked great, so I don't I don't know. I tried 20 different types of encode to see if I could get it look better, and none of it did, so... 
That's a concern. The 60 FPS quality might be pretty bad. And secondly, I hope that YouTube offers the ability to watch 1080p 30 because 60 FPS is obviously going to be about double the bitrate and that could cause streaming problems for people with poor internet connections. So they need to do something about that and I hope that they offer the option there and make 1080p 60 a separate option from 1080p 30. A lot of people are okay with watching videos in 30 FPS and that's totally fine. And I'd prefer to allow them to do that if I can rather than just force them to download a larger video when maybe their connection can't handle it. So yeah, that's the 60 FPS thing. Okay, so a few people have been asking me if I'm going to be attending any events this year. No, I will not. I can't really travel, obviously. I mean, if I'm getting radiotherapy five days a week, there's no way I can leave the town. But once that's done, it's recommended that I don't travel for the rest of the year because I need time for, for my immune system to recover. And the last thing I want to do is get on a plane, uh, which are basically tubes full of germs. That's not a very good idea. So I've cancelled all appearances. I won't be at PAX. I unfortunately will not be casting Red Bull Atlanta. You probably noticed that in cast MLG either. Uh, I did turn all of those down basically due to health concerns. I have to worry about myself at this point. Uh, I would love to go and do them, but that would be extremely irresponsible, and it could very well kill me, which makes doing my work quite difficult. Alright, on to other stuff. So, controversy surrounding the hiring of a staff member for Giant Bomb. And Giant Bomb actually posted a response to this as well. So basically what happened is this person with a history of both hateful and inflammatory comments attacked Giant Bomb for hiring another cis white male to their staff. This person, after being challenged on the issue, told the person challenging them to fuck off. Which sparked a gigantic hate train, which no doubt involved sending things like death and rape threats to this person, and the whole thing blew up and everything's a goddamn mess, like it always is on the internet. This is why we can't have nice things. This is why we cannot discuss these issues like rational adults, because the people trying to discuss them are not rational adults. I've tried to avoid this issue as much as I possibly can, because frankly, it's a minefield. It really is. If we're talking about the involvement of women within the games industry, if we're talking about hiring practices, if we're talking about representation of women in games, it's a minefield. You'll try and say anything on the issue, and you're going to get hit from one side or the other. And it's going to end up being terrible for you. And frankly, you just don't want to be involved in it anymore after dealing with those kind of people. By those kind of people, I talk about the extreme end of the social justice warrior spectrum and the extreme end of what are called MRAs, the men's rights activists. Yeah? And of course, in the middle are all the other reasonable people who are like, hey, we can have a discussion here. And then you've got the wingnuts on both sides hammering you for whatever reason. And we're talking about the same people that unironically called me a shitlord bigot for not being able to tell the difference between a male and a female in Papers, Please, where the gender was deliberately ambiguous. Also, it's pixel art. Like, it's not exactly well drawn. It's it's pretty tricky. Yes, but apparently that makes me a bigot. Uh, that that is the extreme wingnut end of social justice warriors and nonsense like that. And then of course you have the extreme end of the MRAs. They're like, we must defend the hobby. We must defend Giant Bomb. And the most reasonable way to do that would be to threaten to rape the person. Fuck off, both of you. Like, get the hell out of the discussion. Like. This is the problem. They shout the loudest, and they override the discussion. We cannot have this discussion. It's absurd. As soon as somebody from either of those groups gets involved, the whole fucking thing goes to hell. And I'm, I'm just getting angry thinking about it. I'm getting angry thinking about how much pure vitriol and hate is being thrown around over issues which are frankly important and worthy of discussion, but we can't have the discussion because the jackasses on either side are making it impossible to do so. Giant Bomb, of course, has the right to hire whoever they damn well please, nor do they need to give a justification for it. But the person's CV, that's a big enough justification. This guy knows what he's doing and is obviously going to fit in well with the team, so cool, fantastic. I'm sorry that the Tumblerinas get upset about this, and I'm sorry that the MRAs or whatever the hell they want to call themselves, I don't even know, can we just call them shitheads? We're going to go with that, you know? That, that's what I would have called them when I was growing up. It's like, oh, you were going to say this? Well, you're a shithead then. What the hell's wrong with you? Act like a reasonable human being. Ugh, just stop. Just 
What, what else is there to say? Uh, do you want me to present a cogent argument about why these people are shitheads? Who on earth needs a cogent argument? You need to only read what these people are saying to think how can a civilized adult possibly speak this way? Like, me being who I am, I want a solution to this. I want to be able to fix this in some way. I would love to have these discussions properly. It's fairly rare that I venture into the issues of gender and video games and proper representation of various groups, whether they be minorities or not. And every time I do, generally gets a fairly positive response, but you do see the undertones. You do see those lurking beneath the surface who are just ready to pounce whenever you even want to discuss gender or sexuality or anything along those lines. And that that's, makes me really, really sad. Reminds me of when I did that Dragon's Crown video, and both sides hated me, apparently, at that point. But mostly, I noticed that people were fairly reasonable about it. Huh? There was a post in a subreddit called Girl Gamers about it, and I went in there and I explained a little more about my opinion, because I wanted to answer some specific criticisms that had been leveled at me, and I tried to be as reasonable as possible. And a few people came, it's like, oh, mansplaining! That's like... That's baby talk! What the fuck is wrong with you? You know who else makes up words? Toddlers! Use real words, have a proper discussion like a reasonable human individual. And then there was a post on r slash men's rights that was claiming that I was supportive of some ridiculous feminist agenda on the- <laughs> This is why people can't talk about this stuff. If you bring up gender in conversation when it comes to video games, you're instantly labeled by a certain sect of gamers as a social justice warrior or whatever the case, and I'm sorry, as much as some people might want to argue that gamers are just as irrational as any other group or whatever, no, actually, I'd, maybe it's just because I'm exposed to gamers more than I am to other groups, but there's a lot of really dumb gamers out there that say some very stupid things, and there's a lot of either young people or people that are simply not emotionally mature enough to discuss these issues that get involved with the damn discussions anyway and poison the well for everybody else. The whole thing just makes me depressed. That's why I stick to talking about game mechanics. <laughs> God, much, much easier there. I'd rather people be mad at me for saying that I don't particularly enjoy aim down sights than for saying that, hey, actually, you know what might be reasonable if we had maybe one or two more female characters? Uh, that, that might be good. Or maybe, maybe you know, this female character could have some clothes for change. That might be practical. But, uh, yes, I'm a social justice warrior. Uh, fuck that means. Yeah. As I think you've probably noticed, I have thrown away all pretense of not swearing during my vlogs. I've just- I've had it. I've had enough. Call it a side effect of the chemotherapy, but I've had enough with your bullshit. I think if anything, I should do more content on the issue and actually have some proper discussions in a proper moderated environment. That might be pretty cool. I'd like to get some people together and we can talk about these issues in a place that isn't going to be drowned out by nonsense. Yeah. I'd like to have some proper debates, including with people that are not popular or that I don't even necessarily like, because that's what adults do. They talk things out, they have discussions, and they listen to opinions which are not their own because it helps them grow their own understanding. Uh, different perspectives are good. I'll think about how best to do that. Whatever the case, the long and short of it on the giant bomb hiring thing is they hired the person that was most qualified for the job, and I'm sorry, but most of the people well qualified for that position are males. And it sucks that they're males, but you don't hire someone who isn't as qualified for the job just because you want to show some absurd facade of equality. That's nonsense. You hire the person who is best for the job, and you certainly hope that we will see more rising female games journalists or females being involved in game development, because I think it will generally be positive for game development as a whole. It's been positive for television. The rise in female writers has created some of the best series I've ever watched. I hope to continue to see series like that. The more diversity, the better in gaming. Because we will get better stories and we will get different perspectives and we're not gonna get the same old tosh over and over and over again. And that alone should be a reason for any gamer that actually likes this hobby to say, yeah, diversity, not too bad. That and the fact that excluding people for no reason is pretty damn stupid, but at the end of the day, the person that was hired is extremely well qualified for the position. And it does suck that the majority of games journalists at the moment are male, and like I said, I hope it changes, but this is the hiring reality in 2014, and this person was the best for the position. 
simple as that. Equality works both ways. If an employer is supposed to not see the gender, sexuality, or the ethnicity of a person, for instance, then they have to look purely at qualifications. And it's blindingly obvious that this guy's qualifications are ridiculous. Like, he, he has so much experience. And it is entirely feasible that no females with that level of experience applied for the job. And that really is as far as it goes. So either you want equality or you want affirmative action. Uh, which is it? I'm hoping it's the former. It really sucks to see one of the most positive forces in the games industry get attacked for no goddamn reason, so... Screw that. But it also sucks to see someone who, yes, provoked attacks get completely slammed. You know, come the fuck on. H here's the thing that I'll tell you about the internet. This is my experience, right? A lot of people on the internet make hair-trigger morality judgments. And what this means is they see one piece of behavior which is objectionable and they use that as an excuse to unleash all of the hatred and the vitriol inside them on that person then they will feel justified for doing so because that person did a bad thing guess what two wrongs don't make a right it took me a very long time to learn that and i'm not sure i still have fully but I'm getting there. And frankly, it's a lesson that I personally need to learn because I've been on the receiving end of something like this. Like, you know, I posted that stupid piece of shit over on somethingawful.com like a bazillion years ago in 2007. I still get hated for it to this day. I've said and done a bunch of dumb things in the course of my career and it sucks that I've done that. And the only thing I can really do is to try and learn from that and be a better person afterwards. But I can tell you this for a fact that people will look for any excuse. And I think it really is this idea that people, they, people are inherently very flawed and they don't want to accept that. And they want to feel like they have the moral high ground. They want to feel like they're good people, but they still want to be extremely aggressive. They still have that anger inside them and they want to be able to unleash it in a way that makes them feel justified and righteous. So I feel that they look for a flaw in someone's personality and they use that as an excuse to just unleash hell on that person. And they'll feel okay for doing that. I don't think people are inherently bad, but people are inherently flawed. And the problem is that a lot of them don't want to accept that. And that's why we get so much hatred on the internet. And that's why you'll see if someone makes one mistake, they are subject to potentially years of abuse, which is completely and totally disproportionate and does nothing but make that person feel that they are being persecuted and that they have the right to defend themselves however they wish. It only perpetuates the problem. So quit it. Calm down. Calm down, please. Okay, is that enough? Yeah, I think, I think that's probably enough for the time being. I'll, I'll try and keep you posted. As I said, things are, are going well. I'd like to thank, of course, everyone for their support. We've been receiving a lot of messages of support, as well as a lot of messages of concern. I can assure you that things are going well. I am taking pretty well to the treatment. I'm tolerating it. And I am able to work if at a somewhat reduced rate. And will hopefully be able to bring you the videos that you want. Because... I've said it many times before, I don't actually expect people to care. <laughs> no, I really don't. No, all I do is make videos on the internet. And as far as our relationship goes, you watch and I make. Yeah, And I get paid for my job and you enjoy free entertainment and you go about your day. And that's really as far as I would like it to go because I feel that's healthy and I feel that that's as non-exploitative as you can possibly get. And let's, let's try and keep it that way. But regardless, that doesn't mean that I don't appreciate the people that have expressed concern. Uh, that, that's very much appreciated. You are very kind and obviously very empathetic people and you deserve all the praise in the world for that. So thanks for making my day just a little bit brighter. I'll see you next time.